So now let's talk about how acceleration varies as a function of when we go from one dimension to three dimensions. So taking the same particle as we had before, it is moving along the blue path as shown. And at time t0, its position is ri. And at time t2, its position is at rf. We know that your average acceleration is given by the change in velocity per change in time, where v points in a direction of delta v. Now, note what I've done. I've done a very strange thing. Delta v is pointing downwards, which doesn't make sense, right? Actually, it does. So think about it. Delta v is del vf minus vi, given by this expression right here. So this means that delta v is in terms of vf and vi. This is my vf, right? This means if I redraw vf here, it will look something like this. And this is my vi, right? So I need to be able to draw vi over here. But I need a minus vi. So in vector form, minus vi will look like this. The magnitude of the vector doesn't change, but the minus sign implies that the direction is opposite to the one it was initially. And if I do a head-to-tail rule joining them up, my delta v points that way. So it actually does make sense. So in a nutshell, average acceleration is given by delta v over delta t. And instantaneous acceleration is given by delta v over delta t in the limit where delta t approaches very, very small number, almost equals to 0. So in a nutshell, what have we learned so far? For a motion in two dimension, these are the two pictures that correspond to the displacement as well as the velocity vectors. The direction of the velocity vector is tangent to the path of the object. The direction of the acceleration vector is more complicated and generally not pointing in the same direction as the velocity. In non-zero acceleration in two or three dimension does not need to result in a change if speed in an object, it may only change the direction of motion and not its, mo its magnitude, for example, for a circular motion. Motion in two dimensions, when an object moves in two dimensions, we can consider two components of its motion separately. For example, the case of a projectile motion, the gravitational acceleration only influences the vertical direction. In the absence of external forces, there is no acceleration in the horizontal direction, and the velocity in that direction is thus constant. Now, motion in three dimension with constant acceleration. We know and we have developed equations of motions in the last chapter um, to help with motion in one dimension. Can those equations be converted now to two dimensions and three dimensions? And the answer is absolutely yes. Knowing the acceleration, we can find velocity at all times according to equation one and position at all times according to equation two given for a one dimensional motion. Now for a particle that's moving in a three-dimensional motion with uh, three dimensions with constant acceleration, we can represent the acceleration by their components ax, ay, az, each of which is a constant. So in order for us to understand this, let's say a particle starts at t equals zero with initial position r naught and with initial velocity v naught. We can find all future velocities given r not initial position in three dimensions and v not initial velocity in three dimensions um, by using equation one. In terms of their components, they will be written as vx, vy, vz. And in terms of one single equation, they can be reduced down to v vector equals v not vector plus a t, where t is the elapsed time. Similarly, from question two, we can find the position of all the, the objects that are to follow by using these expressions given over here in terms of x, y, and z. All these three one-dimensional equations can be combined into a single 3D vector equation given by this right here. This equation contains within, it, within itself all three one-dimensional equations for these components.